Welcome to the 15 video in the Just In Case series, sponsored by Quality Equality, an OD consultancy firm based in Oxford, United Kingdom. And my name is Mayan Chung Judge, and I'm the director of the organization. We named this series Just In Case because in our learning journey, many of us would be would be appreciating an occasion where we would be reminded about something or to learn something we didn't know or just in case we want to refresh our memory or just in case we want to know a topic better. Today our contributor is Dr. Matt Manningham, a dear friend and colleague of mine. Now in the field of OD, it is truly hard to find someone who combines four roles in a very elegant and dedicated way and that is being a scholar, being a practitioner, being an educator, and being an organization builder. And Matt's combined those four roles in a very, very admirable way. Um, he teaches in a master program of OD. Uh, he organized the OD Education Association. Um, he um, is an adjunct professor and lecturer in many doctoral program and a board member of an extensive list of OD organization. So as a scholar, Matt has contributed to the NTL Handbook of Organization Development and Change, and he has received uh, a number of awards for his outstanding article published in ODP, and now which is ODR. Um, and he was the co-author and contributor uh, in a 2012 book called Handbook for Strategic HR Best Practice in OD, uh, published by the OD Network. Today, he will share the difference between OD and HR and how each play an important vital role in organization. He's very interested in how they can keep their distinctiveness uh, by being separate and yet building a bridge across each other to serve the organization. Some of you may find that... Um, this video is a bit controversial because about the boundary between HR and OD. And I would uh, encourage the viewers will watch this together with colleagues and to really ask the question, how can we simultaneously to preserve the integrity of both of those fields, as well as how to build bridges across with each other. And so thank you, Matt, for investing your time with this uh, video and thank you for sharing your wisdom. So over to you, Matt. Mayan, thank you so much for the uh, gracious introduction and for the invitation to uh, join uh, your video series here. Um, it uh, uh, This is a, a, a vexing challenge for our field. It's a challenge, I think, for OD and for HR. Um, we are uh, two uh, siblings from different uh, parents and trying to figure out how these two functions uh, work together I think is uh, part of our, our challenge as uh, as change specialists, as, as systems thinkers, as OD practitioners, and as HR practitioners. So our topic for today is, uh, hello over there, is that you? Um, how to respect the gulf between OD and HR and how to bridge that gulf. So just uh, so you're aware here, I want to start just from where I'm coming from. I take it as my mission to, re to reduce the gap between the human condition and human potential. We come with unlimited potential in the world, our circumstances, our life, the uh, challenges that we face in the world all constrain the realization of that potential. And um, I want to take it as uh, my job to reduce those constraints and to bring us to our full potential so that we can live a fully uh, realized life. Uh, and I do that by building relationships and trust among people who learn and work together. Both in my teaching and in my consulting, uh, that's the direction uh, that uh, I head in. Um, I've uh, been uh, working in the field for uh, 40 years, uh, uh, internal for 15 years, I've had my own consulting practice for the last uh, 23 or 24 years. Most of my work is with large, large uh, systems, two, three, four-year projects on strategy, structure, 
um, uh, business process, leadership development, and culture. The uh, focus of my work has been mostly uh, international organizations, development organizations, uh, organizations uh, working to alleviate poverty, but also scientific organizations and uh, organizations that are part of the UN system. So uh, my commitment has been to bring the best of these uh, values, the best of uh, my um, intentions uh, to these organizations that help us to build a better world. So the purpose for our conversation today is to understand the differences between HR and OD and to explore the possibilities of working together separately. So in order to understand where we are today, it's important to look at where both these two functions, HR and OD, have come from. Let's start with HR. The first real um, HR function uh, evolved in the early part of the Industrial Revolution in the 1850s and 1860s. Uh, the function was called Industrial Welfare. And uh, the purpose of the function was mostly to keep workers in the factory safe. It was a compliance function. It was a safety function and uh, was intended to reduce accidents uh, in the factory. And that was pretty much the function of the role of HR uh, in those years. Uh, it wasn't really until the 1910s that the function began to expand to include recruitment and selection. And it was about that time that uh, the first uh, re references to personnel management uh, start to show up in the literature. In 1921, the first organization of industrial organizational psychologists occurs, and their role was to create tests for recruitment and selection to determine who are the right people uh, to be hired into these jobs. That was pretty much the role of um, the function until about the mid-50s when um, organizations started to pay more attention to their employee morale. Um, and they also started to, to, to see non-compliance with rules. So discipline became an important part of the function, as did the health and safety of, uh, of the staff. By the 50s and 60s, unions become more prominent in organizations. And so one of the themes uh, in the 1970s becomes industrial relations. How do we manage our relationships with the unions? How do we keep them from going on strike? Uh, and also, it was during this time that uh, several of the key components of the uh, Great Society were coming online with the Voting Rights Act and the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, and so compliance with these rules becomes an important part of the HR function. We also start to see a differentiation between HR management and HR development. Human resource management becomes compensation, recruitment, selection. HR development becomes um, succession planning, becomes training and development. And so those two uh, uh, functions start to diverge in those years. Uh, by the 1990s, there are more calls for a flexible workplace. The HR function starts to deal with part-time employees. They're temporaries now working in the workplace. Uh, online uh, payroll systems start to become really important uh, in the HR function. And then finally, uh, in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, these e-recruitment systems uh, take prominence, uh, online shortlisting begins to occur. Uh, the role changes from personnel officer to HR officer to now HR business partners. And that's a, a lot of where we are today uh, in the HR function. If you look at the OD side, um, you can really understand the, the roots of the field um, going back to the work of Karl Marx in the 1860s, 1850s, when he really differentiated between the role of labor and capital. 
And he was the first um, thought leader to really identify the conflict between those who can produce, who have the, the ability to produce, and those who own the means of production. And that tension becomes figural all throughout the history of OD up uh, till today. Uh, in the 1910s, uh, Frederick Taylor uh, develops his scientific management theory. He starts to build the profile of the perfect worker, the size, the shape, the, the lifting capacity of the man who can move a pig iron from one side of the factory yard to another. He creates selection criteria for the first time. He creates standards by which people are supposed to uh, perform. Uh, by the 1930s, the Hawthorne studies occur where the lighting in the factory changes and suddenly people's behavior uh, in the factory changes. The lights go up, people's performance goes up. The lights go down, people's performance goes up again. Well, now, wait a minute. Maybe it's not the lighting. Maybe it's the fact that we're paying attention to the workers. And this now starts to embed some of the themes in, in early OD, pay more attention to the workers. Also in the 1930s, uh, Nazism is on the rise in Germany. Uh, many of the great German scientists leave the country, including the scientist who is really responsible for the founding of our field, Kurt Lewin. Uh, he departs uh, Nazi Germany in 1932, comes to the U.S., is very interested in the role of the social system on the individual. And you can think of Lewin's um, orientation as kind of circular. And that is the individual has an influence on the social system and the social system has an influence on the individual. And he's interested in the mutuality of those two influences. By 1947, we see the uh, uh, creation of two organizations that are the precursors to the field of OD. The National Training Labs, NTL, is created to uh, provide uh, group-level experiences for participants and group-level research for academics. And in the UK, the Tavistock Institute is created, again, to explore the impact of group phenomenon on individuals. By the 1950s and 60s, we start to become interested in leadership styles. And so we're now starting to think about situational leadership. And maybe it's not just one best uh, style, but maybe leadership behavior should depend upon what's going on in the situation. In the 70s, women's liberation and the women's movement starts to take prominence. By the 1980s, we're thinking about diversity. Uh, we're starting to think about teams. What's the role of teams and what makes them work and how are they structured? We're talking about total quality management now in the 1980s. Uh, also a bit on business process reengineering. In the 1990s, OD starts to embed some uh, outside practices uh, in its work, uh, including after action reviews, uh, including action research, uh, appreciative inquiry, starts to emerge as a theme in OD. And then self-managed work teams also uh, take prominence in the 1990s. By the time we get to the 2000s, um, we see the field, the world, the economy is going global. Uh, coaching becomes more prominent. Um, social network analysis uh, becomes prominent. And we start to have uh, some infusion of new thought into the field with the discussion between and the comparison between dialogic OD and diagnostic OD. So that's a pretty good summary of where these two functions have come from. Now, just I want to just kind of depict how I see where the two functions are today. So today I see HR as largely having analysis and doing the design work of organization jobs. Uh, job design and um, analytical work around job design. Uh, HR planning, anticipating the needs of the organization, taking care of recruitment and uh, retention, doing the selection work, training and development, uh, performance management, compensation and rewards, and uh, employee relations and quality of work life. I think those are the center of the HR function as we see it today. 
We talk about the OD function. Uh, OD, I think, integrates four ideas and ideals. And I want to cite the work of Bob Marshak here uh, in this model. So today we can understand OD as, first of all, understanding the dynamics and the functions of social systems. So OD brings a systems perspective to the world. OD brings an understanding of the role of the third party change agent, which is quite different from what we expect to see in the HR function. OD brings understandings of the hows and whys of change. And then in the center of this model, we have OD values and philosophy around humanism. And that is individuals are, um, uh, have potential that organizations should help to realize that organizations should be democratic. That is, those who do the work ought to have a say in the work and how it's done. That OD ought to be client-centered, which is focusing itself on the needs and the requirements of the client system. And finally, OD needs to be social and ecological. It has to have a, a, a perspective on the social and ecological systems in the organization. Uh, not only a perspective, but an opinion and influencing in those directions. Okay, so if this is where OD and HR have come from and where they are today, what challenges do they face in the future? So we think about OD today. Let's bring OD in more into the latter part of the 20th and early 21st century here. Um, one of the earliest definitions of OD was developed by Richard Beckard. Um, Richard was one of the first true OD practitioners. His, uh, his background was in the theater. He was a stage manager. And one of the things about stage managing, which, which I've done and which you may know something about, is that you're interested in how all, all the pieces fit together. You're interested in how the props and the lighting and the stage and the set design and the costumes and the directing and the acting all fit together into a whole. And so by being a stage manager, you've got to have your, 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 your vision on the parts, but also still be able to see the whole. So with that perspective, here's Richard Beckard's definition of OD. He says, OD is an effort that is planned. Okay. Let's start with planned. It's in other words, intentional. It's organization wide, which means it's systemic. Managed from the top, which means it has somebody's ownership, somebody's sponsorship, uh, and is developed to increase organizational effectiveness and health. So those are the four things. It's planned, system wide, managed from the top to improve organization effectiveness and health through planned interventions in the organization's processes and behavioral science knowledge. Here's a more recent uh, definition that I'm, I'm a bit fond of. Uh, organization development is a body of knowledge and practice enhancing organizational performance and individual development. And we could stop right there. Okay. OD is a body of knowledge and practice. Okay. That's us. Yeah. We know things. We do things. Why? To enhance organizational performance and individual development. We're interested in the both and. We're not just interested in supporting the individual. We're not just interested in improving organizational performance at the expense of people. And we do it by increasing the alignment among the various systems within the overall system. And then there are a bunch of ways how we do it. We use inclusive methodologies and approaches to strat planning, org design, and culture change, and leadership development, and change management and performance management coaching. It's a, it's a long list. But, uh, so here are two definitions of OD that, uh, we can consider as we, uh, head into the, the rest of our conversation here. So as I think about some of the great dualities, you know, some of the, some of the tensions, some of the structural tensions in the world, uh, one of them, of course, is the duality, the tension between capital and labor. Now, this goes back to Karl Marx in his early writing, who said that as long as capital and labor are disconnected from each other, that uh, labor will always suffer and that capital will always prevail. But there's a duality between knowing and doing. There's always tension between freedom and control. There's a tension between the finite and the infinite. 
every life, every system needs some constancy, but it also needs some change. There's a tension between science and spiritualism. There's a tension between absolutism versus relativism, individualism, collectivism. In OD, the tension between diagnostic versus dialogic OD and, and at a, at a basic, uh, kind of, uh, functional level, a difference between Android and Apple. But the duality we want to talk about here today is the duality, the tension between HR and OD. So, uh, here's a question to think about that we'll talk about. And that is, how has the boundary between OD and HR gotten so confusing? My earliest thinking on this topic was about 10 years ago uh, in an article for the OD practitioner called OD and HR, Do We Want the Lady or the Tiger? And the article talks about going back to some of the research from the 1950s when OD was first getting started. There was a tension in the field. There were those in the field that said OD belonged in HR, where it could be buried in the system and could be free to operate without being uh too visible to the rest of the organization. There was another school of thought which said OD needs to be strategic, needs to be prominent, needs to be uh, more prominent in the organization, needs to be at the top of the organization, working directly for the organizational priorities uh, of the system. And uh, the metaphor that I used here is we still to this day have been unable to choose between the lady or the tiger. Do we want to be quietly peaceful in the bowels of HR, or do we want to to stand up, be noticed, and um, and have have a larger impact? And we're still wrestling with that. And I think in the end, that is what um, uh, is the underlying tension, the underlying problem that the OD and the HR field have. So let's talk about the different functions. So what's going on? in the HR world and the OD world that's brought us to this point. Well, first of all, uh, we've seen an unprecedented dissolution of the boundaries around OD. Uh, As human beings, as people, we are the big tent people. We are the inclusion people. We are the people who invite everybody in. But when everybody's welcome in, there is no clarity about who is not in OD. And so we've allowed the boundaries of the field to just dissolve and uh, which makes us ripe for being taken advantage of. Uh, Second, there are really strong academic programs now to teach HR directors and VPs about management. There are master's degrees in leading HR, master's degrees in HRD and HRM. There are MBAs in HR. And so today's generation of HR directors and HR VPs um, uh, is much stronger, much better educated, and has a much better systems view uh, than in previous years. This generation is also better at organizational dynamics. They get the difference between and the interplay between people and money uh, in the system and uh, how to manage people and money at the same time, which is a fairly new competency uh, for the HR function. At the same time, uh, the function itself is more professional. Uh, More and more organizations are requiring a a bachelor's degree, sometimes a master's degree, uh, sometimes advanced education in HR, and uh, that is raising the bar uh, in the HR function. Uh, In addition, uh, OD is now seen as kind of... the career advancement route for HR people. OD is the top of the HR career ladder. And as a result, um, uh, it's uh, it's a function, it's a role that uh, HR business partners are striving for. Um, HR business partners want to be more relevant uh, to the business. And so the more and more they take on OD type perspectives and OD type roles, uh, that makes them more relevant to the business. And uh, the bottom line is that uh, HR has now acquired, and I would say monopolized, and I would say neutered the OD function. 
So let's look at the two different functions and just uh, see if we can get uh, down to what's underneath the outer shell here. So the essential role of the HR function is to recruit, retain, and to develop uh, people, to get them in the door, keep them in the door, mm -hmm. and uh, keep them in the door as long as we can. They're also responsible for employee relations and for staff well-being. Engagement survey always falls to the HR department. Climate surveys uh, typically have been the purview of the HR function. Uh, also responsible for workforce planning and work workload management. Um, I would say most HR departments are better at the first. Uh, they are not as good. They're better at workforce planning and not necessarily as good at workload management. The essential role of the HR function is to minimize labor costs. How little can we pay these people and still have them come to work every day and do their job? It's to enforce corporate policies and avoid litigation. So how do we keep ourselves out of court? How do we ensure compliance? How do we make sure that we're following the organization's own policies as well as any regulatory or statutory requirements uh, needed? And uh, finally, the HR policy, HR function uh, role is to reduce disruption and reduce and eliminate irregularity. They're really interested in the uh, operation, the smooth operation of an organization and uh, maintaining the status quo. So now let's look at the OD side. Mm. The intentions, the purpose of the OD function are quite different and I would say quite opposite from those of the HR function. At the top of the list for the OD function is to improve the effectiveness of the organization. How can, how can the organization do a better job of its job? How can the organization be more effective at its work? And in order to do that, the OD function is interested in maximizing the potential of human beings and how they contribute, how they can contribute to the organization. So here we're talking about giving them voice. We're talking about delegation. We're talking about engaging them in the way the work is done. We're talk about, talking about engaging them in how the organization operates. That's a way different role than the HR function traditionally has had. Uh, our role at OD is to make sure that there's alignment between the strategy, the structure, the business processes, and the behavior to create an effective corporate culture. So we're looking at the parts of the system and how they fit together and work together in order to create an effective corporate culture. We're looking to embed humanistic values in the workplace. We want the workplace to be a civil place. We want the workplace to be a place where people's, people's potential can be realized, where they can be fully engaged where all of their skills can be accounted for and maximized, and where people feel empowered to take decisions that affect them, their work, and the organization. At its bottom line, the role of the OD function is to create change and disruption, which is quite the contrast to the role of the HR function, which is to reduce disruption and to reduce irregularity. So, to summarize, fundamentally, these roles are different. The role of the HR function is to manage compliance, it's to reduce payroll, and to avoid risks. In contrast to the role of the OD function, which is to expand capacity and create experiments and to take risk. So, you can see the differences between the two functions. What's the downside here? What's wrong with this picture? What, what goes bad when HR has acquired and subsumed uh, OD? Well, th there are several substantial problems. Uh, first of all, you have good, well-trained OD people who are basically doing HR business partner work. They're enforcing grade profiles and complement control and telling people why they can't get promoted. Uh, they're designing and delivering training, which is not the highest and best use of our OD skills. Uh, they're doing succession planning and talent management. And while that contributes to the organizational performance, 
you don't need an OD degree to do talent management. You need a good understanding of HR processes, but that's not a, the highest and best use of our skills. Uh, you end up with good OD people trapped doing performance management, spending six months every year redoing the performance management system, which nobody likes and nobody appreciates, and yet good OD people waste a lot of time and energy on that. Uh, you have um, uh, people, OD people, working through and beneath business partners, so they don't have access to the client. They only have access to the client through the business partners. That makes the challenge of leading organizational change and supporting clients in change a bigger challenge because you have no personal relationship with the client. It's now brokered through a, a third party here. OD people delivering compliance workshops. Huge waste of our time and talent. Buried down in HR, what OD people hear about the organization is through the lens of HR. And so an HR director or VP hears something about the organization. They take away the HR perspective. They pass it along down through their system. And by the time the OD person hears about it, if there ever was a systemic perspective on the system, it has now uh, evaporated. Um, so the OD person ends up even further disconnected from the business. And worst of all, um, we know what people think about HR and people who come from HR. And so getting tarred with the bad reputation of HR uh, is never a good thing, uh, particularly if your role is to um, uh, effect organizational change. One quick story. I was uh, consulting to an organization where the OD function was put into HR. It was had been in strategic planning, uh, got moved into HR for a variety of exogenous reasons. Um, so the OD people and the HR business partners were all working in the same client systems. And uh, there was a rule in that organization that the HR business partners could only talk to the client VPs with the HR VP. And so that meant it took a week or two or three to get for a business partner to get in to see the VP because those were the rules in, in HR. Well, the HR business partners started to object to the fact that the OD people could have direct access to the VPs, could have direct access to their clients. And so they leaned on the organization to insist that the OD business partners, um, sorry, that the OD consultants, the internal consultants, follow the same rules as the HR business partners. And so what had been the ability to pick up the phone and call a VP and set up a meeting and work on a problem together now became work with the HR business partners to get a meeting with the HR VP and the client VP. And so all of the relationship building, all of the direct access, all of the direct understanding of the business problems, all of the direct understanding of the contextual uh, issues facing that system now evaporated because the OD people were being constrained by the rules that govern uh, operations in HR. So here's a question to think about, and that is respecting the differences between OD and HR. How do we build a bridge between the two functions? So my solution to this question is we need to get smart and we need to be smart as a function as OD practitioners. First thing we need to do is we need to make sure we are plugged in to the major pestle factors affecting the organization and its environment. Pestle being, what are the political factors affecting the organization and its environment? What are the economic factors? What are the social factors? What are the technology factors? What are the legal factors? And what are the environmental factors that are driving the organization? OD people need to have a solid handle on the drivers of the environment that are having an influence on organizational performance and organizational decision. Second, we need to be really strong and much stronger than we have been in understanding and working our way through mergers and acquisitions, especially the part around blending 
cultures and blending business processes. Too often, the OD people are left with the implementation and are left out of the design because we haven't made it our business to be smart and to advocate at that level. And so we need to do a better job of uh, uh, being effective at mergers and acquisitions and protect particularly around the social factors that we know better uh, than anyone else. We need to do a better job of being global, understanding global cultures, understanding how to work with different cultures, uh, and also today, more so than ever, uh, how to be virtual, how to work across time zones and cultures uh, virtually, particularly uh, in uh, these days today. Uh, OD people need to do a better job of being attuned to the organizational politics. Too many of our people say, oh, that's uh, that's that, that's not for me. Uh, politics should be somebody else's problem. I, I just want to do my job. Well, if you're not plugged in to what's going on in the political system of the organization, I say you're not doing your job. We need to understand what the influence makers, influencers, thought leaders are thinking and how they are relating to one another in order for us to do a better job in working within that political system. We need to do bigger and better work than the HR function on equity, on diversity, and on inclusion. We need to be advocates in those areas in a way that the HR function typically has been too timid. So the HR function sets up employee relations groups. Okay, yeah, but then what? The HR function counts the number of people on a shortlist and makes sure it's a diverse shortlist. Okay, but those are compliance functions. They're not, they're, they're not change functions. They're making sure the organization follows its rules. We need to be advocating on an advanced level for equity, diversity, and inclusion. We need to advocate for sustainability in all decisions. In the tension, particularly in most private sector organizations, there's a tension between short-term and long-term. Short-term investment, short-term share prices, short-term return to investors, all of which we need to acknowledge. But too many times decisions are made in the short term without a perspective on sustainability, without a perspective on the longer term. And we need to to be advocating uh, for that. We need to keep an eye on the system view. We need to have a perspective of the whole system and how the parts fit into the whole. Every every column in the in the organization, every column on the org chart has its own stovepipe, and, uh, and they're they're managing the space within their stovepipes. We need to be looking at the space between the stovepipes. We need to be looking at the interface among the functions so that we can see how the system as a whole is working. We need to stop playing small ball. In too many, too many times we've just turned over our, um, uh, our responsibility. We've turned over our effectiveness. We've turned over our power to others. And so we haven't stood up. We haven't pushed back. We haven't uh, made sure we're playing at the top of the organization. We haven't put ourselves on the most important task forces. We haven't volunteered our services to to be leading um, big projects. And uh, as long as we continue to play small ball, we're going to uh, minimize the impact that we have on the organization. We need to set the rules in the contract with HR. What are the terms under which OD and HR are gonna work together? And if you're taking an OD job in HR, you need to make sure you got a strong contract for access to leader, direct access to leadership, for unfettered access to the structure, for the ability to, to operate freely without constraints. Um, yes, you want to have some relationships with the HR business partners, but if in fact your, um, access to the organization is through, uh, the business partners, you're going to end up working at much too low an altitude in the system and you'll be undermining your own success. And uh, finally, I would say we need to know, we need to be known, and we need to be trusted uh, by senior leadership. Uh, the best internal jobs I've ever had, and in the best client systems I've ever had, 
I was able to call the boss, get her or him on the phone, and have a direct conversation and solve a problem in 10 minutes uh, and start to work on how to, to advance advance the situation. So when we build those relationships with senior leadership, we need to be looking for ways to intersect with senior leadership and to know, to be known, and to be trusted by senior leadership. So how do we do that? My suggestion is this global OD practice framework is the most thoughtful and comprehensive um, overview of things we need to be able to know and do as OD practitioners. Uh, I worked on this project for the OD network. I've worked on it in its first draft and most recently on its second draft. But as you can see, the language here is powerful. The uh, We start at the top at uh, 12 o'clock there. OD people should be efficient designers and process consultants and data synthesizers. And we should be business advisors. That is a catalyst for strategic change. We need to be a results-oriented leader. Uh, we need to be a trusted advisor. We need to be a credible strategist. That is influencing credibly and communicating collaboratively and being able to navigate across cultures. We need to be an informed consultant that is self-aware, use of self as a leader. We need to be an advocate for equity. We need to be a lifelong learner and practitioner. And finally, we need to be a systems change expert. We need to have content knowledge in how to change a system, which means we need to be a systems change leader, a culture builder, and an innovator. So I think we've got a big challenge as a field. I think we've got a long way to go. I think we have um, uh, uh, to change our ways. We need to change what we believe about ourselves, what we believe about others, and what we believe about the world in order to rebuild the boundary and create the distance between these two functions. Uh, but in the meantime, I hope this has been helpful to you and to your work. Um, I hope it allows you and us all uh, to continue this conversation because a strong OD function is better for you. It's better for us all and it's better uh, for uh, these, for our client systems. When we work at the highest point in the system, we have the highest leverage and impact in the office of the CEO, the office of the COO, in the operations function, even in the CFO function wherever we can attach ourselves to a leader with vision, to a leader who has scope and a leader with vision, um, we have the highest likelihood of doing our best and our most effective work. In the end, it's our work, the way we use ourselves in our client systems, to make our client systems better, to enhance their organizational performance and individual development for a better, healthy, and more sustainable world. Thanks so much for your time and attention. On behalf of everyone, thank you, Matt, for sharing your powerful reminder of the gifts each of our few has to offer to organization and how each of us need to position ourselves in the best way to serve the client. I'm very grateful for you to be evoking us to think about boundary, integrity of the field, as well as partnership, working together. And so um, those of you who are viewing this, I hope that you have lots of fruits for thoughts about what, whether you are internal, external, how do you work with each other to bring the best uh, to those whom you serve. And a big thank you again to you, Matt, for sharing with us what's really, really important in your heart. And thank you, viewer, for staying with this. And I want the audience to know that you can contact Matt for further discussion in this area. His contact details and his publication and his link um, is all at the end of the video. So... Thank you, Matt. Again, a very big thank you to you for taking the time to share. And for the viewer, thank you very much for taking the time to stay with this video. And everybody stay safe, stay well. 
Goodbye.